Hi everyone, a um, couple of words before we start. This is my impromptu well of sheep, and I really expected that at the security conference this would be empty. So if you see yourself here, or uh, hopefully you don't want to see yourself here, just make sure you use sane browsing. All right, enough blabbering. Let's talk about cyber. Who loves the word cyber? I hate it. Yeah, I figured that. Um, what I'm gonna try and do in the next 50 minutes or so is talk about cyber war and cyber crime. Um, cyber war especially is a very problematic word uh, or term and uh, a lot of people will have different views and opinions on it. Uh, I went to the cyber war talk an hour and a half before, which was really good, because it did talk about the different aspects of it, especially from the political side. Uh, I'm gonna try and talk about some practical sides of cyber war or cyber warfare uh, as it pertains to what we are seeing on a daily basis, which is mostly cyber crime, and see how these two connect. So without further ado, my disclaimer, um, this is what we're gonna talk about, cyber war, cyber crime, the definitions, attack, defense, uh, and then we're gonna look at some history and see how these do actually connect. Um, this is the first time I think I'm, I'm presenting some solutions as well, or talking about some uh, uh, options to solve this or, or approach this in a more general way. Uh, so bear with me and ask questions if you have some. These are obviously not the right solutions. And, uh, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about the future. So just a bit about me. Um, why the hell am I standing here? Uh, I've been dealing with uh, security, computer security for the past 15 years. Um, my only certification is my bachelor degree, which I barely got. Uh, I'm a hacker <coughs> just because I like to break stuff and, and look into stuff, and I guess that's what got me here. Uh, I'm a researcher, uh, which means that I'm a hacker with uh, some basic academic <laughs> understanding, so I can actually write down stuff and, and repeat it uh, on, on other research areas. I did do some development, uh, which was hard, because making stuff work is much harder than making stuff not work. Um, but I, did, I just had to do that. And so I do have some background in, uh, in development and, and management develop, managing development. And in my spare time, <laughs> for what it's worth, um, um, I do some work for the Israel Air Force as, as a reserve reservist officer. This is not going to be a FUD talk. And if you do feel that you're being FUDed, throw something at me, not the sharp or, or a glass object, but just pick something up, crunch a paper and throw it, and, and I'll do my best to avoid FUD. All right, let's get to business. And this whole research that, that talks about cyber war and I'm gonna say cyber a lot, so if you hate the word, just, just walk out, it's fine. And this whole cyber war thing started when I was doing some cyber crime research, which is fine, it's okay, we're all in, in the business. And, and during that research, we managed to, to get some access into a criminal server, the server that was hosting and operating a lot of, uh, a lot of activity for five different criminal groups. And we started finding material that didn't really fit into our uh, hypothesis or, or what we're trying to accomplish in, in the research, which is connecting the dots between, uh, or basically seeing how cybercrime works from a business perspective. And the reason it didn't fit is it, it, we couldn't see how it got translated to money. Um, shoot a projector again, okay. Uh, this is a map. Or, or a satellite image with uh, uh, markings for targets. Um, again, this is not material that you usually see on a cyber crime server. Um, this is another screenshot of a PowerPoint slide that was found on the kernel server as well that details a, some kind of drill or an exercise or an experiment with deployment of ground targets, equipment serviceability checks, F-16 launch, trials, and, uh, and what's happening in the background, which you start to understand, we're talking about things that fly and drop bombs and go boom. 
and, and measure the accuracy of those things that fly and drop the stuff and go boom. And again, it didn't really fit into the, the mold. And just like any good researcher, you initially try to fi find the outliers and say, oh, well, that, that's, just ignore that. And so my thesis can, can stand by itself. And so we did that last year, but I did keep the outliers and figured, you know what, let's look into them. And again, this is another screenshot of the application that manages the things that fly. You can see F-16s and A-64s, which is Apache for the layman, and flying around and being controlled by this pretty GUI. And so we figured, let's track this down and uh, try to see where it pops up again, because obviously it's not going to be sold in a Carter forum or uh, being sold to some money mules that are going to cash out of it. And, and we found some interesting stuff. So that's basically the, uh, the initiative for this whole talk. Before we go into cyber crime, cyber war, and stuff like that, an easy question. I know you're kind of from lunch. <laughs> what is this? A gunshot. All right, a bullet hole. This is what we're dealing with on a daily basis. We investigate this, we look into this, we're trying to find out what caliber is this, what kind of damage it did, blah, 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 blah. Great. This is what we don't do. We don't look into the perspective. We don't zoom out and look at the big picture. Who shot that bullet? In what context? Who was the target? Why? And this is exactly the difference or, or the, um, the differentiating factor between what I'm doing here and what I did last year. It's trying to understand the context of things. It's trying to understand the, the, the motivation, the actual targets for those attacks, um, the ammunition, where it came from, and trying to basically draw the line between a criminal act and an act of war or a warfare uh, is very hard. The actors are kind of the same. It's the same people that manufacture the ammunition and research vulnerabilities and so on and so forth. So, as any good cyber war talk will tell you, you have to go through definitions first. And this is the best, well, well, this is the most likely definition, or the definition that I like the most, of cyber war. It's taken from Wikipedia, and they're saying uh, cyber war is the use of computers and the internet in conducting warfare in cyberspace. Great. But it's kind of bullshit, because <laughs> as you know, warfare is done at a strategic level and involves a lot of stuff, not just cyber. It involves planes and people and tanks and politics and legal stuff. Some people say there is no cyber war. Anyone know who this is? Skylas, hate, hate me, my guts by now. <laughs> no one? He's famous. Schmidt. Schmidt, as I like to call him. Uh, <laughs> never met him, but <laughs> we're friends by now. And this is Howard Schmidt, he's the cyber czar for the US, second time, by the way. And, and he was quoted officially saying there is no cyber war, which is kind of, kind of defeats the point of a cyber czar that's responsible for cyber warfare, saying that there's no cyber war, but who cares? And, and, but the people who say there's no cyber war usually say, well, except for, and they give an example, or two, or three, or whatever, Estonia, Georgia, Titan Rain, Google, Adobe, uh, India, Pakistan, <laughs> the list goes on and on. Uh, so there's always like an, exempt, uh, an exempt, exception sorry, uh, to saying there's no cyber war. Um, again, I think this is bull as well because we are living cyber war. Some call it cyber espionage, some call it cyber warfare, some call it acts of cyber whatever, uh, they usually leave the cyber to get money. And basically what I'm saying is you have to connect the dots to realize what kind of cyber war you're living at. And without doing that, you're basically you know, treading water and you're not really being helpful to your country or whatever. And this is not the only way cyber war is being conducted. You're not gonna see Pentagon shooting bits at the Kremlin or vice versa. And it's not spy versus spy, all right? It's not all you know, secret, ultra, uber, cool hacks uh, running around with guys in uh, shades and stuff like that. But much like war, civilians will be hurt. Civilian infrastructure, civilian websites, uh, it's called collateral damage for the 
definition freaks. And remember that because that's, that's going to be part of cyber war or cyber warfare act. These are the usual suspects. I've stolen this from McAfee with their permission. And this is taken from their 2009 virtual criminology report. And they point out five major actors in countries developing advanced offensive cyber capabilities. You have the usual ones, US, China, Russia, France, for some reason, and, and Israel, a little tiny spot in the middle, which is the only case where size does not matter. And these are the guys that I am going to talk about. And I've left out France for obvious reasons and uh, added uh, Iran. My pointer is dying. Added Iran just because I have more data on Iran and they're actually doing cyber war. Yeah. True. There, there are a few more countries. I'm just limiting myself to five. And, and the reason is, again, this is what I have researched. This is the data that I've seen. Um, there are much more you know, classy cyber war acts like uh, India and Pakistan and China and Canada that was looking over the whole thing like they used to do. Um, but this, this is what I have. This is what I've seen. I only have limited time to do research, and I'm kind of lazy, so it's limited to these guys. Um, let's start with just going quickly through those countries and looking at cool logos. U.S. is fairly well documented. They do a cyber, uh, a cyber drill every two years, uh, and which you can actually, cyber storm, sorry, uh, that you can actually read about and see who participated and what they did there and what kind of uh, uh, drills they did. Uh, massive recruitment. Uh, a couple of months ago I saw a, a, a newspaper, an article stating that there are like a thousand or two thousand cyber warrior jobs uh, open in the different U.S. Uh, departments of whatever. Um, again, you have the usual suspects over there: USCC, the, the Cyber Command, uh, that's headed by General Keith Alexander, four-star general, uh, that basically merged all the different cyber commands that were uh, so far, which are, <coughs> sorry, Air Force, Marines, Navy, and Army. Uh, you have the NSA, of course, that's dealing with uh, espionage and cyber stuff. And, and other three-letter acronyms, this is my favorite one, it's the CAT team. And it's an FBI team. Anyone knows what CAT stands for? Very cool. Cyber Action Team. Okay, remember that. If you get someone knocking down your door and shows you a little CAT sign, he's the Cyber Action Team. Off to Russia. Mother Russia, love the Russians. Um, <clears throat> Russia is, is kind of a mess, and, and we'll touch about we'll touch Russia in, in a few seconds. Um, but these are the, the major players: the GRU, uh, SVR, FSB, uh, that kind of split after the whole KGB thing, and it's it's again, it's Russia. Uh, one of my favorite ones: uh, the Center for Research of Military Strength of Foreign Countries. Instead of just creating a three-letter letter acronym that doesn't mean shit, they just stated everything in their name. So no need to explain here. Um, and you have to remember one thing about Russia. They have NASHI. It's a national youth associations of some kind uh, that are basically led by the political parties. Can you say parties in Russia? Um, <laughs> And uh, it, it's kind of Boy Scouts on steroids, and, and they, they basically get directions from the polybureaus and stuff like that. And can, they can actually do some harm or, or get, you know, um, get motivated to do stuff. Um, China, surprisingly, well documented as well. I'm not going to go over this. Uh, there's a Northrop Grumman report that was issued last year, I think, uh, that details exactly how the Chinese PLA works, the, the um, People's Liberation or whatever, Army. Um, all the staff departments, what they're dealing with, what's the methodology, what's the, the ammo, everything. Just, just beautiful. And yes, Tide and Rain, if you haven't heard about it, read about it. I'm not going to cover it here. Iran. Iran is, is, is a problem because there's not a lot of uh, documentation. Surprise. But <clears throat> if you look into Iran, You'll see that the um, telecommunications infrastructure company, again, another company that doesn't, you know, bullshit with its name, uh, who's responsible for all telecommunications in Iran and all fiber connections in and out of Iran, is basically controlled by the army. 
And this is what their connectivity look like, looks like in the past five years. It just goes whoosh. So they're highly connected, uh, which is something that people don't take into account these days. Last but not least, little tiny in the Middle East, uh, Israel. Uh, this is going to be kind of boring because this is all Google data. Um, there's the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, which is the army, um, that has been noted to add cyber attacks capabilities. <coughs> um, and that's from Google, again. Uh, each army branch has its own C4I, again, classic military stuff, command control, communication, computers, and intelligence uh, in the Air Force, Army, and intelligence. Staffing is mostly homegrown, uh, as opposed to a lot of other countries which means that everyone who turns 18 in Israel gets recruited to the army, serves three years, and if he knows anything about computers, uh, he'll find his way, or his way will be found, <laughs> into, into the right uh, departments in the military. Um, and of course, there's Mossad, all right? Secret, ooh, scary, but they have a website, and they have a job section, which you can go to, and just Google Translate it and see what exactly the Mossad are looking for in terms of recruiting people, which is very interesting. Again, homework. This, this, is, this is a talk, by the way, where you'll get homework, and I'll check them. Uh, so go to the Mossad website. It's mossad.gov.il. Uh, try to find where's the job section. Google Translate it. A lot of fun. All right. We touched the countries. Let's dig into cyber war. This is cyber war attack. This is my definition, all right? Not the Wikipedia one. Uh, I say that an attack is a highly selective targeting of military and critical resources in conjunction with a kinetic attack. Again, we're talking something a little more strategic here than just shooting bits down the wire, all right? You gotta have some effect. You gotta have a better access than just some hacker sitting in the basement. Or just DDoS the hell out of them, uh, wipe out, Connectivity. Make sure that no one can get to Twitter or the news website, the local news site, or BBC or whatever it is. And this is mostly done for political effect, for propaganda, which is again a classic act of just general war. And instead of just flying around and, and dropping leaflets that try to convince the, the local population, you know, you need to leave your houses because we're gonna bomb the shit out of you and you can use the internet now. More effective. Defense, and I'm an attack guy, and which, which means, again, I'm lazy, so it's, it's easier. But defense, defense is a problem because it's never, never just military. We talked about the attack and we said that there's always gonna be collateral damage. And we've seen that the DDoS just wipes out connectivity for a whole area, and so you have to think about your civilian infrastructure. Uh, which means that the physical and logical protections are going to be like your last line of defense. Which means that, from a defensive perspective, you will have to choose, at one point of time, a legitimate tactic, which would be, you get no access, because my server is melting. So it's either you not getting access, or my server melting for good. Uh, so that's a valid tactic in cyber war defense, to cut down connectivity or to cut down services, for your constituency, basically. Off to cybercrime. This is gonna be simple. If you don't see this, you're doing something wrong. You're not looking at cybercrime. All right, you got it? We're all good? Excellent. Uh, why is this? Well, because cybercrime is a business. And it's a business that's running probably better than any of the businesses that you guys work for. They're highly organized, they're highly efficient, they outsource everything. They cut costs. Money is all they're after. They're not nice about it, but they're very efficient. Okay, this is last year's talk. Um, again, highly organized distribution channels. Uh, they can focus on different geographies, languages, financial institutions and financial regulations. They know everything, and they know it better than you guys do. Uh, that's why they're making so much money. That's why we still have cybercrime and viruses and worms. The attack, again, we'll just blow through this, is this the classic one. You get the viruses, the worms, the phishings, the trojans, um, open communication channels, web, email, whatever it is. Some of the attacks will be commissioned and highly focused. We call them targeted attacks. 
some people call them APT, I think. Um, <coughs> they will focus, as I said, on geographical regions because the finance, uh, uh, the, the economical kind of thing differs from country to country and from geog geography to geography. Uh, in the US, to conduct cybercrime is much different than con to conduct it here in Europe because all the chip and pin and all that stuff. Um, secondary infections will be used as well. Once you get some foot uh, uh, on a botnet or something like that, you can leverage that to get more infections. So if you get infected, your friend will get infected, your mom will get infected. You sound like an AIDS commercial. Um, this is what it looks like. <laughs> this is what it looks like when you're looking at cybercrime. This is a single server. Uh, again, that old server that we managed to, to get a hold on. And these are all the URLs, or these are all the websites that it got infected in order to get their visitors infected. And we basically GOIP them into a map so it's not like, you know, scientific, but it's accurate enough. And you can clearly see that they're focused on very specific geographical regions. Western Europe, East and West US. Okay, why? That's where people are, that's where the money is, okay? That's where the money is. There's no one in like Freaknik, Nebraska, you know, holding a lot of uh, money doing uh, online banking. They are, however, in East, West Coast and Western Europe. These are the groups that we managed to pinpoint. Again, highly geographically focused. They know their regions, right? They will work with other groups and exchange data and exchange information uh, for the stuff that other groups couldn't use on, in their regions. Uh, these are highly evolved communication channels. You can see them on IRC, you can see them on, uh, on forums, exchanging data, trading stuff, uh, and so on and so forth. Again, we're not gonna, this is not a cybercrime talk. Ammunition, we talked about ammunition before. Uh, this is you know, the classic ammunition for cybercrime. It's old, but it's working. Hello. <laughs> it's old, but it's working. Why? Because the detection levels are basically zero. And uh, this is Zeus. I can still make Zeus infect a computer and bypass 42 different antiviruses just by, by clicking build loader. Why? Because this is my version. And once I click build loader, I get my binary. Unless it gets distributed everywhere and people start noticing, I can use this. All right. The Lifetime expectancy for this is anywhere between three to four days if I mass distribute it to a month if it's a targeted attack. Hence, I can weaponize this and, oops, and do an APT. Second time I, I said APT, it's enough for now. This is the back end for Zeus. As, you, as you've seen, Zeus is, is very like, graphical. You don't need to be an Uber hacker, or, you know, assembly kind of coding language in your sleep. You just click, build, deploy. And this is the back end. Again, it comes with the wizard for the installation and stuff like that. And this is where you manage all your bots. Once you've distributed them, either you know, nationwide or very targeted, uh, you can drill down to a specific area or category or whatever it is, down to, to a single PC level, get all the information you want on it, issue commands, update it, whatever, all right? It's an administration tool, right? Defense, oh, I love defense. You must be saying, Ian, we have anti-virus, malware, spyware, rootkey, trojan, whatever, anti-stuff. Yeah, seriously. And this is what it looks like. And I can make this happen right now, again. And I'm just too lazy to replace my screenshot. And once you create a new variant, its, it's level of detection are basically zero. And if you don't get to zero on the first hit, just keep trying, you'll see you'll get there. But then you're saying, Ian, there's firewalls, IDSs, IPSs, stuff that protects our network, watches it, and blocks your attacks. Right. How about port 80, 443, 53, anyone heard of these? These go basically unmonitored, and if they are monitored, they are encrypted, which you can break, and you're basically blind to everything that runs on your network. These are the channels that run most of the kernel software. And if you remember Aurora, yes, yeah? okay, 
Aurora was basically communicating, communicating with, over DNS. So until people started figuring out, well, we're not really logging DNS or looking at DNS, um, they didn't see Aurora. Once they started looking at the DNS, they're like, holy crap. <laughs> and that's how they found or, or tracked down Aurora. So how do these two connect? We talked about cyber war, we talked about cyber crime. My claim is cyber war is being conducted by criminal outlets, by criminal organizations. To prove that, let's look at a little history. We started with Estonia. Estonia is, is fairly well documented. People made their whole you know, hacker fame on just analyzing Estonia and, and dealing with it. So I'm not gonna talk about it too much. The bottom line is that civilian infrastructure was targeted from other civilian infrastructure, RBN. And off to Israel. Israel is interesting, and then you're all probably sitting here saying, hmm, what is this guy going to say? Anyone knows what this is? Syrian All right, good. It's the Syrian site. It's the Syrian nuclear site. This is the before and after. And what's interesting about this picture is that you'll see in the after that there's nothing there. Anyone can guess why it was so cleanly wiped? Because if you bomb something, there's rubble and shit flying around. And anyone? The picture has changed? No, this is not Photoshop. Okay, remove evidence. Why would you remove evidence? As we, by the way, this is how it looked like before they bulldozed the area. Uh, you remove evidence because it's it's shameful to admit that your nuclear reactor was blown up when you have absolutely no evidence of any flying things coming into your airspace. Yeah, not in Syria, not in Turkey, and not in Lebanon, which you have to cross if you're you know, launching aircraft from Israel. It's basic geography. Just try to draw a line that doesn't go through there. You can't do that, and somehow, Somewhere, those radar systems just did not see airplanes flying around with big bombs that go boom. So this is one of the first examples, or one of my favorite examples, for uh, the synchronized act of using cyber warfare with actual kinetic warfare. Okay? There is a goal to everything. You just have to fit in the pieces. And this is, again, fairly well documented. Um, We'll do a brief talk of Israel. Uh, the, the whole cast led Second Lebanon War was, uh, was riddled with cyber conflict as well from both sides. Some, are, uh, some were attributed to hacktivism. This is uh, an Israeli effort to basically create a botnet, <laughs> a volunteer botnet, install this, and uh, we'll just make sure that your, you know, your bot, your Trojan, not Trojan, but bot, will attack uh, specific Palestinian sites. Uh, same goes for the other side. Um, these are activities that were tracked down to a forum called AR Hack. What's interesting about AR Hack is it's a hacker forum by day, kind of political, and a cybercrime operation by night. Hence, we see again the connection between criminal acts and the warfare side. Uh, this is a political post from AR Hack. Uh, if you don't read Arabic, Google is your friend again. And it talks about you know, all the politics and stuff like that. I'm not going to get into it. This is another post, buying and selling cards for half their balance. Not very political. Yeah, selling 1,600 Visa cards. Same forum, different activities. Off to Georgia. We love Georgia. Small little country, very interested. Um, Again, fairly well documented. Go and read Grey Goose Project reports. Uh, I think there are two, two different reports detailing what's going on there. Uh, again, my main point here is that, oh my God, uh, is that it's the f one of the first attempts of, of Mother Russia basically to synchronize, fully synchronize a kinetic and a cyber front on the same conflict. Uh, again, targets were, were mostly civilian on the cyber front. Uh, and the attacks came, again, surprise, from civilian infrastructure, from civilian networks. To understand what's going on in Russia, it's going to require a whole new talk, but anyone heard of those companies? I'm sure you did, right? 
at some point. These are the famous Russian companies that deal with uh, cybercrime. Okay? They're highly connected, uh, highly organized, and have very established links to the government. Right? Very established political links. Uh, you can make a lot of you know, pretty pictures. This is just my feeble attempt. Uh, you can see the host fresh and new cartel group are hosted by Trivo, which is a customer of Easter Domains, which is a customer of the RBN. Um, to which Hostfresh and UKRTL group are also network providers that provided it, uh, provided RBN kind of a safe harbor in 2007 when they went offline because they got too much crap on the media. Everything is connected with crime and, and there are direct links between the RBN and to the Russian government as well as to Nikolo, which was shut down about a year and a half ago and dropped spam volume by 75% in one day. Now that we've established how the criminal outlets in Russia work with the government, let's look at what happened in Georgia. This is how it started. They basically flooded the president's website, brought it down, and some select, uh, additional select media outlets. And then the command control center was shut down as the troops moved in. Perfect synchronization, by the way. And then, six new command control centers came up and attacked specific sites. President, news sites, Kaspara's website, which is politically not correct in, in Russia, I guess, to say, and other websites that uh, related to Georgia. On the same time, however, they were still conducting their usual businesses, which is carding, muling, attacking porn sites, adult escort services, gambling sites for protection, card forums, web money, web gold, blah, 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 the traditional cybercrime operations at the same time. All you have to do to be able to say it might be cyber war is just to connect the dots. Very simple. It's not rocket science. I'm saying it, so it's not rocket science. Um, some more homework. Look up the attack on the city of Gori in Georgia during the, the Russian-Georgian conflict. Uh, you'll find a very interesting fact that the, all the media sites and some local government sites in Gori were attacked or DDoSed to hell 12 hours before the Russians actually bombed it. Now, that was very synchronized, very tactical attack. You know, this is not Tbilisi, like the, the major, the capital. Uh, and no one could have guessed that the army was going to, you know, pick Gori as a target. But still, the DDoS, the cyber attacks, were on specifically on Gori. Really blow through and ran quickly. This is Twitter, okay? I ran. And Twitter was taken down December 18th, 2009. Everyone went, oh my god, I can't tweet. And the attack was attributed to a group called the Iranian Cyber Army, which did not exist before July 2009, just a few months before the actual attack. If you track down an Iranian Cyber Army, you'll find a group called ASEAN, uh, which is linked to it. Iranian Cyber Army is actually a subgroup inside ASEAN. This is what they do there. Defacements, political stuff. It's the same HTML template, by the way, that was used for the Twitter attack. <coughs> now, if you look at what's going on in the Iranian Cyber Army, this is their daily business. They have war games, okay? Target practice. In a war game, you get a post that says, all right, this is the target for now. It's kind of a capture the flag for hackers, for, for whatever you want to call them. This is the target. This is a scoring system. This is what you have to do to get the best you know, score, to gain access to computers, manage them, steal data, all the way up to the basement because you can't get in. And these, <coughs> sorry, these are the targets. They're not random targets. This is, the, this is the Chester County Natural Gas Authority. OK? Again, not really cyber crime. Can't really get money out of these guys, but in a warfare situation, that's very interesting. Okay, critical infrastructure. What else happened on the 18th, the day Twitter went down? Come on, no one reads the news? Nothing major kind of happened on that front? Something that might have spurred a little political controversy around the world? No? Basically, the Iranians marched in Iraq and grabbed an oil well and said, mine. Why didn't anyone talk about it? Because Twitter was down. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
More recently, the, the Baidu takedown, same ammo, stole the DNS credentials, logged in, changed it. The Chinese and the Iranians don't work together for some reason. So quick recap, this is how Ashen works. DDoS side defacements, credit card, the traditional cybercrime operation by day. Subgroup of ASEAN, Iranian Cyber Army, established just a few months before the Twitter attack, focused on strategic attacks on China and the US. Try to draw the line between crime and war. Not so easy, but it's easy to connect the dots. The unspoken. I'm going to be the first one that doesn't mention this word in his talk today. So there we go. I didn't say it. Oh, um, we just have 10 minutes, so we're going to skip through China and talk about actual solutions or solution proposals. No, 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 no. Crime, war, state, China, Google, Adobe. And this is interesting, by the way. If you look at the China, the Aurora attack, it was tracked down to a university. And that's why, by the way, the US said, China, we look at you to, you know, to clean your act up. But the university professor says that, oh, yeah, everyone uses this network. <laughs> it's like, it's a known thing that criminals actually use this as a base for their operation because it gives them immunity. A bit about the future. What does the future hold for us? Well, um, take one, for one case for example. Everyone knows what this is, cute little thing, all right? Uh, what happens if you give a cute little thing with no protections to people that have no money to protect it and it gets infected? You have single-handedly created one big-ass botnet that you've paid for. How cool is that? Think about it next time you're handing out PCs to people. Weapons of mass destruction of the internet. There is no such thing. There is no internet kill switch unless someone really wants to lose a lot of money. And what there is, is connectivity. The bigger pipe you have, the more of a man you are. Yes. It still works. Let's talk about solutions or, or trying to figure out how to combat cyber war, or define it or put it into some kind of political context. I was fortunate enough to, to be participate or whatever you want to call it in NATO's cyber common strategy for 2011. One of the things that came up there is the issue of deterrence. Um, I hope you're aware of Article 5 of the NATO pact or whatever it is, which basically says if a state gets attacked, all the other NATO countries can go up and attack back. Well, I think it's a great idea. Adopt it to cyber warfare. And basically say that if a, if a nation gets cyber whacked, get all the other NATO countries, member countries, to retaliate in a manner that would deter an attacker from doing something like that. Then you're basically saying, are you nuts? There's this whole attribution thing that everyone was talking about in the past three years in Black Hat and DEF CON and stuff like that. Well, attribution is nice and it's, it's, it's a major problem when you're talking about cyber crime, but for cyber war, it's less of an issue because you're talking about nations and politics. And if one state gets whacked cyberly, it will know <laughs> in which political context it happened. And you know what? Attribution can be done even to the source of the attack, the technical source of the attack, the one that's, you know, the first step. And the reason is, if you state that there is an Article 5 like that, every state will have to take care of its internet and make it clean and not enable other actors in the political scene to use it as a launching pad for their attacks. So all those stories about, you know, the Chinese hacker that goes into a US website that attacks North Korea and makes you know, a big war between two nuclear countries uh, is not completely bobcast, but in the right conditions, it can be deterred. Okay? So this whole attribution thing is not, you know, oh, it's too scary, we can't deal with it, let's run away from it. Deal with it, but don't stick just to the technical side of things. Right? Look at the big picture, look at the politics. Quick summary. Like always, there's good and bad. The good is that there's a lot of formal training. You guys are here. The different countries that are developing those cyber weapons are investing a lot in training and uh, 
and, and knowledge and education. The bad thing is that the criminal side still has the upper hand. They have the cooler tools, the better researchers, unfortunately, and, <coughs> and the better reach. All right, remember the pipes? Who's got a bigger botnet? RBN, okay? Who attacked Estonia and Georgia? You guess. Uh, which leads us to the ugly. If you want to shortcut your way into cyber ghetto, I just said that? No. Um, if you're a developing country that wants some cyber capabilities, what would be easier developing your own and investing a lot in training and getting people and, and you know, educating and blah, 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 or just buying this stuff like everyone's doing on the black market for traditional weapons, I mean, okay? It's the same thing, just on a different angle. Solutions, go figure. First, we need to fix the cyber crime problem. Uh, we're getting a lot of uh, head start on this. States are actually starting to cooperate. Uh, you see a lot of conferences from the law enforcement side that basically bridge those gaps and, and wipe out the geographical borders uh, in an effort to fight cyber crime. Once you get that fixed, only then I think you can start talking about you know, treaties such as the nuclear armament treaties. Uh, only after fixing the cyber crime stuff you can think about cyber treaties. That's all I got for you today. If you have any more questions, please ask them now or forever be silent. If you have a question, I would ask you to raise your hands so we can get you the microphone and every uh, question should be taped as well. Or shout. Shout. <laughs> Are there any questions? Nothing. People are still very tired from still? the lunch break. Yeah. I'm tired from the lunch yes, break. <laughs> What got you started in this line of research and connecting the dots between crime, war, cyber crime? Cyber crime? I, I, I want to say a higher academic goal, but it's just coincidence, I guess. It's that, you know, finding data that didn't fit into the research I was doing at the time, and I guess having the audacity of kind of trailing in and trying to figure out what's going on there and challenging a lot of the assumptions that were made before. And finding, like picking up rocks and finding stuff that's like, ooh, crap. <laughs> it's nothing really academic or, I'm <laughs> sorry. Thanks. Sure. Any more questions? Yeah. Over here. Run. Um, a lot of things uh, going on there are uh, economic. Right now, a lot of countries are engaged on low-key economic warfare against other countries, from currency um, uh, stuff to uh, espionage. Mm -hmm. uh, how far do you think that the cyber war stuff is more aligned with the low-key economic warfare out there, and how much different it is? How much of it is it's real warfare, as in the Estonian and Georgia as a case? Well, I can tell you that. The, the subject or the topic of economical warfare in use by cyber warfare is on every nation's agenda. Uh, every example, every cyber drill that a major nation is conducting includes financial institutions, the, the nations like major <coughs> bank, uh, everyone's looking at uh, simple things like defacements of a, of a bank's you know, currency exchange website. You know, it's a simple site the big economical uh, entities are not really looking at it because they're getting the direct feed, but it has a huge influence in terms of small businesses and general population. In terms of uh, Estonia, it was scary as hell. Scary as hell. They did not have anything working for a few hours, which could have been easily extended to a few weeks. Uh, if you talk to Estonian government official, they will tell you that if it would have gone on for more than a single day, you would see riots in the street. Everything runs there on the internet. All the banks are running on the internet. All the government is running on the internet. There are the country with the most efficient, like their elections 
are online. So it, it, it was a smart pick to, to use cyber warfare or to DDoS on Estonia as a proof of concept in, in terms of uh, in Russia. Uh, and again, you have to think of, of, of this as in, in a more strategic way. It's not a, you know, just a cyber attack. It's looking at the big picture and connecting different elements, the kinetic ones, the political ones, the economical ones, and the cyber ones. So it's, it's definitely part of a nation's defense and offense strategy. Last one? Very last yeah, question. just last one. He's been waiting so nice. <laughs> so I have a small correction for your slides. Excellent. Uh, the old PC example that you gave. Which one? Doesn't, the, the old PC, the hundred dollar laptop example that yeah. you gave, doesn't really hold so well because actually it still runs Linux with uh, virtualization jails enabled. So okay. it's actually a hard target. But I agree in general with you know when you have lots of netbooks, etc. Then yeah. okay. <laughs> but for the next next time. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Guys, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. We have to wrap up. Thanks a ton to Ian. Um, if you still have questions, I'm sure Ian is going to be around. I'll be around. Okay. Um, next up in the bar. Yes.